Hey everyone, it's Jim from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 71, we're going to take another look at how to achieve great sound by looking at the preamp. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. In the last two episodes, we talked about the importance of sourcing high-quality recordings. This week, we're going to look at the next stage in playback. Yep, you guessed it, the preamplifier, or preamp, as everyone calls it. Now, all kinds of specialized preamps exist, designed to boost low signals and to control them. You've got microphone preamps, tape preamps that not only boost the low signal, but apply the proper tape EQ. And more familiar to most of you are phono preamps, which also boost the very low signal and apply the reverse RIAA EQ. EQ is just short for equalization, right? Today, we're going to focus on what is commonly used in quality home audio systems the line control preamp. What this combined pre does is simple. It amplifies the signal and controls the volume. That's the line part. And it also controls the inputs and outputs. Maybe it has a fader, a uh, balance control, etc. That's the control part. Now, it may look simple, but if it doesn't handle the signal cleanly, or provide enough clean gain for the power amplifier, nothing we do later can fix the problem. So the preamp is as important as any other part of the signal chain. Okay, now all that blah 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 is boring as all heck. So let's build an actual preamp visually so we can see what the parts are that make up a great sounding Class A preamp. Okay, so I'm just using my Universal 6 or 12 SN7 kit preamp as an example. Everything I say can apply to any quality preamplifier. Now this is just the prototype build. The actual kit build will be much cleaner. This has just been rebuilt so many times. So let me just flip it over. Now this is a very simple preamplifier. It's got two pairs of RCA ins with a simple switch that goes between them and the center off, one pair going out, right? So it's a stereo preamplifier, but it's a dual mono design. Let me show you. We've got two power supply boards and two separate preamplifier boards. Hence, this is the left channel, this is the right channel, and they have their own separate winding on the power transformer, their own filter stage. So each channel is essentially its own entity inside one box. That's why it's a dual mono design. But can you make any sense out of this? Well, you can maybe figure out that that's probably the board for the volume control. Those, all those wires coming in, that must be the RCA in, and that must be the RCA out. But other than that, it's really tough to figure out how this thing works, right? Okay, and that's what we're going to do today. So. Let's steal the tubes, because we're going to need them for the demonstration. These are my actually my daily listeners. I'm really in love with these early photons. These are Russian-made tubes, and these are all from 1965, and they're a very interesting variation. And we're going to do a mini review on these. I've, I've found a whole bunch of them from the 50s and 60s. After I discovered these by accident, I went searching, and... Um, I had some good conversations with my Ukrainian and Russian wholesalers, and one of them had some. Um, finding tubes from the 50s and 60s is not easy. Anyways, let's put this aside. Okay, now I promise you we're not going to spend much time with the schematic. This is the power supply schematic, and yes, power supplies for all kinds of amplifiers are critical. A good power supply can make, make or break an app, but we're not talking about that today. <laughs> Everybody breathes a sigh of relief. 
We're going to take a quick look at the actual schematic. Let me zoom in so you can see it. There's not much to this. Here I'm showing a junction in, but behind that, this is just, this is the build PC. This is the build design. So it matches up with the components on the boards. So there's a junction in, but behind that is an RCA, right? Everybody knew that. So here comes our signal in. We have a coupling capacitor, we have a bleeder resistor. We have a first stage gain. We're showing two tubes, but actually this is the 6SN7 is a twin trial, right? Both, both circuits are inside one envelope. There's two tubes in one glass envelope. <laughs> the first time I heard that, it just blew my mind away. <laughs> Um, and there's other variations on that as well. Um, but anyways, we're not going to get into that today. We take the amplified signal off the first stage, off the plate. Here's our little signal coming in. Here's our bigger signal inverted coming out. We go through another coupling capacitor. We go into the second half of the same tube. We take the signal off the cathode. When you, when you take the signal off the cathode, you get what's called unity gain, or in reality, you might have a small loss in gain, but essentially the amplified signal stays roughly the same coming off. The difference is the signal is high impedance here and it's low impedance here. So impedance is referring to the resistance of the circuit. And you always want to drive your next stage from a low impedance point of view relative to the next stage. So you wouldn't want a high output impedance preamplifier driving a high impedance amplifier. That just, it doesn't work. You can lose power that way. So always low impedance into high. So that's why preamplifiers typically finish off with a cathode follower stage. That's very common. We go through a coupling capacitor and out we go on our merry way to a power amplifier, right? Okay, let's build this circuit. Okay, so we're gonna start with a good quality RCA input jack. Yeah, everybody gets that. This is an isolated type, so the ground, which is the whole outside of the housing, doesn't actually connect up to the middle of the chassis at that point. We wanna bring the ground over to a star ground point. And that's a discussion for another day. Just keep in mind that we have a good isolated, good quality isolated RCA jack. Let's back up a bit because our circuit's gonna get built. We're gonna have a little bit of high quality hookup wire. I like to use this, let me just untwist it here for you. This is a multi-strand pure copper wire. It's 22 gauge that handles the vast majority of low to medium voltage applications in amplifiers easily. Um, I think it's rated for 600 volts. I forget the current rating, but anyways, it can easily handle the kind of current we're talking about. It's, it looks silver because each strand is tinned. And what tinning does is it gives it a lot of corrosion resistance and good conductivity. And the multi-strand means that if the wire flexes in, let's say, where it connects to the socket, because every time you put a tube in, when you plug a tube into a socket, I don't have one handy, but imagine, the pins move. Every time you pull it out, the pins move. So if you're using solid wire, it's going to get it's going to get work hardened, and eventually it'll break. And I actually did a video on my R8 getting repaired because it had a, it had a number of of build flaws, in my opinion, that weren't significant, but combined they caused a problem. They essentially did not put any extra wire at the connection to the pin and use solid wire. So it, it eventually just broke off where it kept on wiggling back and forth. If they had put a little tiny extra loop in that wire, it wouldn't have happened. And if they'd used multi-strand, it probably wouldn't have happened. Anyways, this is my favorite hookup wire. It is a, um, fiberglass, it's a dual layer, it's got an outside braid, and it's fiberglass um, and uh, silicon impregnated. And it's, it's very fire resistant, it's very flexible, it looks great. Anyways, the, 
important thing is conductivity, right? So any kind of good quality hookup wire is going to give us the conductivity we're looking for. So let's connect it up. We're going to go into a coupling capacitor. In this case, I'm using Solon black fast caps. Let me get it up close so you can see it. This is 1.1 microfarad. It's higher than it needs to be, and its voltage is higher at 400 volts. Basically, if your voltage is a little bit more than you need, or even twice as much, it doesn't matter. So long as you cover your voltage rating, you're good. Higher voltage, of course, is bigger and more expensive. Um, but their standard size is in 400, 450 volts is very common for a coupling capacitor. I use these because they give me audiophile quality sound at an affordable price. And they're very consistent caps and they're, and they're fairly commonly available. And I'm lucky to have a commercial account, so <laughs> that helps a lot for the kits. What you want with a coupling capacitor is, is nothing. You want it just to pass the signal through cleanly without coloring it, without changing the EQ, and that's what these fast caps do. You can spend a lot less and get a really crappy cap, or you can spend an incredible amount more and get maybe, and I say maybe, a slight improvement in sound. But you might have to spend a hundred, a thousand times more to do that. Okay, what do the coupling capacitors do? They block DC. Let me grab the circuit here. So the circuit is powered up by high voltage and the signal is low voltage alternating current, AC. And the two of them can coexist on the same wire at the same time. But we, in certain places like the input grid where the signal comes into the tube and the input circuit, the output circuit, we want to make sure that we only have AC because DC can make a lot of noise and can cause a lot of problems if it gets into stages that it doesn't belong. So a coupling capacitor does what it says it does. It couples the signal safely. So if there happened to be some DC present, even a little tiny bit on the input, it would not pass through the capacitor. Only our audio signal comes Sliding through. Okay, yeah, everybody got that. We go into the grid of the first stage of the tube. Let's just mount the tube up here. There's a bunch of resistors that are helping to control the operating point and to keep the circuit working properly. They're not directly in the audio chain and we're not talking about them. I've done other videos in which I talk about how tubes work how the whole circuit works. So you can look those up if you're interested. Today we're interested in what are the quality components that handle the audio side of things. Okay, so we take that signal off of the plate. Let's just grab that schematic again. It's gonna get boring. <laughs> Try not to. So we have high voltage present here and we're gonna take our audio signals riding on the high voltage. We're gonna take it off and we wanna get it into the grid of the next stage and we can't put that high voltage over here. So we use a coupling capacitor. Okay, I think everybody's starting to get that. So we use another one, identical, 1.1 microfarad. Now I'm showing you two tubes and in fact on the schematic I show you two tubes but we've already talked about this. Both these tubes are inside one envelope and all of those pins get us access to the two different tube circuits. But for, for depiction purposes, we're going to actually stick the tube right here, right? Just like I drew it on the schematic. And we're going to couple the signal to the next stage. What's left after that? Well, we're going to couple the cathode out, our low impedance signal. We're going to put a high quality RCA jack. This is actually a polished plated gold solid copper um, uh, RCA jack. And this is, I prefer these, um, I forget what they're called. They have a specific metal finish, but um, let's call it matte gold. I prefer these. I'm not a big fan of flash, but if you like flash, you can order, you know, your kits with the 
and your parts, they're in the store. You can order the polished gold version if you want. Okay, and out we go. That, this is pure class A. Notice that there's no feedback. Now, what is feedback? Let's look at it. Let's look at the schematic. Feedback would be if we took any part of the signal anywhere and brought it back to any stage. It can come back on to here. It can come back to here. That's feedback. And feedback is used predominantly in power amplifiers, but it can be used in any circuit. And it's often used to either provide more gain or to reduce noise and or to reduce noise. But in my opinion, it messes with the cohesion of the signal. And unless it's absolutely necessary for the design, you will never find me using feedback. I've experimented with it and I just, I really don't like the results. Once you have a pure class A signal, don't mess with it. It's already perfect. Now, okay, so here we go. Here we got a pure class A little preamplifier. It sounds great. You can see that the components are good quality and nothing's messing with it. But some people are working with balanced circuits. What is a balanced circuit? Well, a balanced circuit takes one half, the, let's say the positive phase, and passes it through this whole thing and takes a negative phase and passes it through an entire another circuit. Now, power amplifiers cannot amplify balanced circuits. They actually have to be recombined before you get in. So they're only useful from, um, uh, from microphones through your preamplifiers, and then they have to be recombined no matter what you want at the power amplifier. So what would a balanced version of this pure class A preamp circuit look like? Well, you would double it. The entire thing you're looking at here, all those resistors, everything has to double. And you would have twice as many components. So now you understand why I argue fairly strongly against using balanced for home audio. It has applications. If you have a long um, studio microphone cord that needs to be run low noise it's perfect for that application that's what it was designed for in the home we don't have any long runs at all unless you've got you know a huge listening area and who has that um, and even then you can your equipment can be set up so that um, it's all relatively close together and your your cable runs nobody should have cable runs other than speaker runs uh, cable runs should be under three feet three feet or under in my opinion. The shorter, the better. Okay, enough of that. Hopefully, hopefully you learned something. So what's going on over at Melatone Kits? Well, as always, lots. So let's just clear the decks. Let's put these down carefully. They're never going to build more any more tubes from 1965 like that again. Okay, now, two, yep, count them, two of the Yuri monoblock builders finished up last week. And both of them were successful. They had no problems. The only issue uh, that came, issues that came back were some small uh, material quantities issues. And I'm revising that as I hear about them. It's one of the reasons why we do test builds, to make sure that my, you know, we're pulling for uh, the Uri monoblocks, we're pulling 172 parts, I think, from inventory. So, if we had a, you know, it has to be tested out more than once to make sure that the inventory list is correct. And the preamps pull 270 parts. Can you imagine? Anyways. But the, the great thing is one of the test builders put a review into the store. And I'm going to read it to you because it's just really such a great thing. So, um, I have just completed the URI monoblock with three high school students as an electronics project. Now, this is a great product and the support was superb. The videos gave precise guidance. Students with minimal soldering and fabrication skills were able to follow the videos easily. 
The music sounds great, even with a single channel without a preamp, and we look forward to incorporating this component into a full-fledged system in a future project. I highly recommend the URI and the high quality of support provided during the assembly process. Well, thank you to that test builder. Um, that this, this is all I need to say thank you for the work, <laughs> the hundreds of hours that Charles and I put in getting these kit put together and um, at, to the point where we can start marketing them. So anyways, that's just wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, so what came in this week? This is, this is my favorite part of the whole show every week. Now, many of you know that I have a few 6SL7s that I absolutely love. And this is in my top three favorites. The there's a couple of Sylvanias that are, I would say, very close to the melts tubes. These were made in the um, 1950s, pretty much. I don't know if I've ever seen a date code be below 1950, maybe 49. Uh, and I don't think I've seen a date code in the 1960s. So we're talking about tubes that were made um, roughly... Um, 60 to 70 years ago. Imagine that. So, and they, they these are a mil-spec premium tube. So they were not that common even when they were brand new. So finding them is tough. They're expensive tubes used even. But what's worse is the, the high gain tubes from the 1950s, the melts tubes, even the Sylvanias are prone to noise. And that's Partly a, a simple equation. The higher the gain of a tube, doesn't matter what tube we're talking about, but the higher the gain, the more the noise floor is. So let's say you had um, a tube with a gain of 35 and you had a tube with a gain of 70. The, tu the gain with a tube of 70 is going to have, that's a 12A T7, it's going to have exactly uh, twice the noise floor automatically as part of the design as the lower gain. So high gain uh, 6SL7s, which also have a gain of 70, um, are prone to noise right off the bat, or being noisier. The melts tubes and the Sylvania tubes from the 50s all have the same problem. They tend to be noisy. And that means that a lot of them get thrown out. So I found in the last shipment that came in, I had five arrive. They were a mixture of almost new old stock and looking used. Uh, and they all tested good electrically. In fact, they were exceptionally good electrically. Two of them were noisy. Two of them got thrown out. Two out of five. And that's really very typical. So I do a lot of live listening tests with these tubes to determine if they're noisy. And in most cases, I weed out the noise and only the good tubes go to customers. That's any good tube seller, vintage tube seller is doing that behind the scenes all day long, every day for customers. And my garbage pail, you would be shocked at how many beautiful looking tubes end up in the garbage. So enough of these came in that I've got matched pairs in the store again. They're testing good. There's going to be a variety of appearances. It's it's just the nature of the beast. Look at this one. It's looking very new old stock. It's testing at what I would say at just below 80%, which is really good used. If you look at the pins, it looks really like it is a new old stock tube. The label is so faded, it's tough to see. Have we, can I even see a date? Maybe 54, it's tough. I can't see that date. I'm going to put this in as a used tube. The new ones, new old stock tends to be about 50%, sometimes 100% the price of a good used tube. So that's going to go in with this pair. Have a look at the base of this tube. It's, it's very close matched, almost a perfect match. The base is showing some signs of corrosion. Now, that's a cosmetic issue. And to, many of these mil-spec tubes went to sea. And of course, salt air, and especially salt water, is corrosive. And these bases tended to be very susceptible to corrosion. So if they got a little wet in storage, 
the base might show a little bit of surface corrosion. This is very surface. If you look at the pins on this tube, they're, they're absolutely pristine. So don't worry about cosmetics. On, on any vintage tube that is rare and highly desirable, and these are, don't worry about cosmetics. What you want is good match testing numbers, good high testing numbers if possible, and low noise, especially with high gain tubes like that. If you're too fussy with a vintage tube, you're never going to be happy. What matters more than anything is how do these sound? Well, they sound warm, rich, very detailed. If I was to say anything about these is that they have a depth of detail that only the Slovenias come close to matching. The Slovenias probably have a little bit more warmth and richness, sort of like the difference between a good quality EL34 and a Muller EL34, but they don't have the same level of depth. So both tubes are fabulous, both types are fabulous, and Sylvania actually had a lot of variations. So there's some little subtle differences. The melts tubes, they had some variations in manufacturing, but they're all basically the same. They all sound the same. They're all made in about the same decade. Okay, so those are in the store for, for somebody to swoop down and grab. Um, and I only have a handful of pairs, so don't pause if you wanted to get your hands on some melts tubes. Here's some discount codes to help you. Uh, the Mullard sale is going to run all the way until the end of the month. And there's still some nice quads left in the store if you're interested in jumping on that Mullard 100 code. And of course, I've got flat rate shipping of $20 around the world. And if your order, you can't see it. But if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me, folks. And all the other discount codes, of course, work as normal. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Vowels and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.